Welcome to The Lover's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. You're with Mike and Ian. And we are rereading the Aubrey Matron books of our favorite author, Patrick O'Brien. Ian, we were discussing, you know, that battle station, dressing station, uh, 30 minutes south of the line or something. Catch us up part one of chapter nine. What happened? What are we going to see to end this novel? Well, Mike, it's very exciting. Uh, there's so much going on in Chapter 9 that it's worked out in our favor, I think, to split it in two because we've got the big payoff coming. Even though last time we had seen a lot of action, Jack and the Surprises having sailed into Moahu, having deceived and defeated the Franklin's mercenaries there, having joined forces with Queen Pulani, having managed to get Queen Pulani to sign on now as a loyal subject of King George. Jack had drawn up the battle lines ready to defend against the coming attack from the north. While all this was going on, Mike, we had learned more about Clarissa as she and Oakes, with the active help of both Jack and Stephen, were looking set to be ready to go home aboard the True Love to a new life in England. That was last time. This time, Mike, we're at the dressing station. We're going to see battle coming with the forces from the north. We're going to hopefully hear about the Franklin in the offing. We're going to have the spoils of war, both great and terrible, as the current story of Clarissa Oakes comes to an end. And if that wasn't enough, also in this episode, we're going to wrap up the novel with an interview about the character of Clarissa with our old friend, novelist Rachel McMillan. Can't wait. Oh, you and me both. You and me both, Ian. Well, you know, we, we were talking about that dressing station and the night before the battle, Jack, Stephen, Pullings, West and Adams all slept there in the dressing station. So we're Thursday night here. The carronades had come up to the cleft where Jack had positioned them much easier at less than a half a ton apiece than certainly Kalahua's gun, that ton and a half cannon has gone over the mountains here. And, you know, Jack points out that the carronades are going to be much easier to point in battle, to point and adjust than Cal Lewis cannon here. Well, Stephen wakes at, you know, at first light and realizes that the others have left silently in the night, just like, you know, the the sailors during night watch here. As Stephen goes outside, he sees a number of Pulalani's men coming past the dressing station, greeting them, all dressed for battle. And... He remembers that they had seen Kalahua's campfires about an hour from the cleft last night. So the northern men, the men of the north part of the island and their white mercenaries should be reaching it pretty soon. Now, Stephen was thinking about Queen Pulalani. You know, he'd heard some more tales and it was said that her husband had proved to be a man of inferior parts so that she had placed him at the forefront of another cleft battle, just like this one. And so she kind of put him right in harm's way. No wonder the translator changed his voice when she declared her faithfulness to King George would be the same as her faithfulness to her husband here. Yeah, awkward moment there amongst those in the know. (laughs) Exactly. And I'm sure the counselors were looking down so that nobody saw the giveaway in their eyes, right? Well... Stephen is thinking about what could be real carnage here and what could be real jeopardy for his friends a half hour north here. And he's repeating verses to distract his mind from the coming battle. He's thinking to himself that the men down in that canyon in five minutes firing would have at least 6,000 lethal cannonade shots aimed at them. And that, you know, the cannonades could be loaded and refired within a minute, multiple times here. So Stephen starts to chant plain song, and he's just kind of reaching a crescendo when the cannonade fire cuts him short. First four at once, then perhaps two, the echoes are kind of confusing, then four more shots, and then silence. And he wonders, has has battle been joined? Have the carronades been overrun? There's, There's just no way to know. And time now seems to speed up. It goes faster now. And, and, you know, not very long after, a single young runner passes Stephen, his face alive with joy, shouting what must be a message of victory. Stephen can't understand it, but he's thinking, you know, looks like we've won here. And then two more men pass, each carrying a human head by the hair, one a Polynesian head and the other a European head. 
And then some surprises come up, you know, bringing one of the first of the carronades back, reporting that, in fact, no surprises were hurt or killed, nor were any of the Queen's men that they know of. And one old shipmate of Stevens adds, but them poor, unfortunate buggers in the gully. God love us, sir. It was bloody murder. Wow. And it's it's really solemn. I'm struck here by the fact that this is yet another twist on how action works out. We've said before that O'Brien doesn't let us get bored with the way actions are described. And this is very different from actions that we've had before. We've had shore actions, but not often set piece cannonade based actions like this. We haven't had, you know, ambush and maneuver quite like this in a kind of planned and set piece way. But even though this is a unique action in the history of the canon, we still don't get to be there. This is Patrick O'Brien. We don't get to be there first person. It all comes in reported speech. It all comes secondhand. And it's really grim. First of all, the, the visual of the guys running back down the gully here with the, with the heads in their hands. Jack appears looking somewhat anxious and Bondon's a little way behind him there. Stephen gives him joy of the victory. In, the, in my ears, anyway, this is already sounding a little hollow. And right. Jack says thank you with a, with a kind of a smile, a bit of a forced smile, and tells Stephen that all that did not run away are dead, so no need for the dressing station, and suggests they take a side path down following the slope to hit the Iahu River. And he asks Bondon to help Padine with the medical stores, which are probably not going to be needed here. They walk in silence until Jack stops at the stream to wash his face and drink deeply. I'm, like, I'm, I'm just struck here that earlier in the chapter, immediately after the previous action, we had Stephen washing his face. And I wonder if there's a symbolism in the juxtaposition now of Jack being the one who washes his face. He asks if Stephen would even like to know how things went. And Stephen says he can tell that it distresses Jack to speak of it. And Jack says, well, that's going to pass. And he gets on and says, the scheme, the ambush scheme worked perfectly. The enemy was tired. They were worn out from dragging the cannon, they were short of food. They had all come into the cleft and the Queen's people had plenty of time to get out ahead of them. Jack says, I should never have believed Case Shot could do so much damage. I must say the French came on very well, leaping and scrambling over the bodies. Two rounds dealt with them. But even Kalahua's people rallied and charged with a shout, some of them almost reaching the guns before the last broadside. They stopped firing and let people run. We only fired 10 rounds, Stephen, but there was a butcher's bill like a fleet action. And although the hands were pleased, of course, scarcely anyone raised a cheer and it was not taken up. And Mike, this is very solemn. It reminds me of another famous quote about the aftermath of a battle uh, at this particular time of the, uh, of the 19th century, which was uh, the Duke of Wellington's famous aphorism that there's nothing so terrible as a battle lost apart from a battle won. Mm, wow. <sighs> and I, I, I'm still wondering now how this is going to work out between Jack and Stephen. Stephen clearly feared that there was going to be a really bloody cost to this action. And Jack is really having to tell it and lay it out for Stephen coldly here. He does. Well, Stephen you know, replies back to Jack that Jack clearly did not follow his plan of closing the back end if he'd let people run away. Yeah. And Jack said, well, it wouldn't make good sense to close them in, that he'd only told Stephen that he was not going to allow a line of retreat in order to make Stephen's flesh creep the way Stephen does to Jack with all his surgical horrors. So I thought this was, you know, kind of an interesting moment here. And then Jack kind of buttons it up. He said, it is my belief, Stephen, that you do not always know when I'm being droll. Well, this, I guess if that's your sense of humor, sometimes I miss it, Jack. I can, I can hear you going <laughs> himself here. Well, this is the first sign that Jack's depression is lifting. And uh, he responds well as, as they finally make their way into town, having taken a couple of wrong turns and, and this big triumphant welcome. The queen leads Jack under these great special arches of greenery that have been built with cannonades sitting by either side. And then she takes him individually to greet each of the branches of the tribe. So, you know, all the kind of tribe branches are off in their individual groups. And when Jack and the queen come up to him, they fall flat 
But O'Brien writes, not flat enough to hide their delighted smiles. Yeah. And, you know, O'Brien tells us that these groups of people, the beautiful day, the celebrations, the scented breeze all put a barrier between the morning slaughter and the entertainment which follows in the Queen's house here. As Jack enters the house, all the surprises officers are dressed in splendid feather cloaks, kind of like the one Pulani had worn the first day they met her, and each one a completely different color. And then Pulani brings one over for Jack. It is crimson from shoulder to toe here. So we remember all the time in the colonies and islands how, you know, crimson is the most revered. You know, everybody wants that crimson thing. So Jack gets the best one. The queen puts it on herself, and she she kind of leans over and whispers to Jack. To Pia later says that the queen had whispered to Jack that it belonged to her uncle, who is now a god, and that it's meant to be a present for the captain. So he's not just wearing it in this banquet. It's his to keep here. Yeah. And then Pualani modestly pats a seat next to her for Jack to come sit. And, you know, and everybody is thinking... You don't see Pualani do much modestly. So no. it's clearly a little dynamic starting to play out here. Yeah. And this is going to be one of the big set piece meals that you'll remember, I think, throughout the canon. Um, not so much for the uh, quality of the conversation and not so much for the you know, puns and jokes, but for some of the side descriptions of what's going on here. The, the, I've been looking forward to this for the whole way through the book here. The food is served. Everyone gets a choice of some meat, some fish. There's turtle. There's great ceremony with the serving of the dishes. Jack chooses to be served meat, and the queen serves him. And we learn exactly what kind of meat it is, as Stephen discreetly notices a human ear floating in the bowl and asks Tapia to tell the queen that man's flesh is taboo for them and quietly tells the officers that this is forbidden meat. Tapia says, well, fair game. This is the flesh of Kalahua and the French chief. And Pualani laughs, changes her fishbowl with Jack's meat and assures him that the crew is okay. They are eating pork, which is taboo for her. So many taboos, she says, (laughs) smiling. (laughs) If only King George knew. (laughs) (laughs) There's great feasting. There's lots of music and singing as they're eating. And then when they finish and they, you know, they can't eat another bite more, the dancing starts. It's all very good, but the surprise's greatest applause and cheering is saved for the women who dance the hula. Mm. Stephen says he's really glad Martin's not here. You know, he doesn't would not want Martin to witness these licentious postures and wanton looks. And Jack says he has no objection in the least. And as Jack is watching all this, he starts feeling sleepy. He finds himself stifling yawns, and he's looking wistfully at the at the kava bowl, that you know that stimulating drink here. But the cupbearer, it turns out, is a little too captivated by the dancing girls to notice Jack's look. But the queen sees it, and she fills Jack's cup herself. Ah, Jack's getting some personal attention here. Yeah, definitely. Well, conches blow. It's sunset. Jack sees the sun dipping to the horizon. It's time for the entertainment. An eight foot figure covered in basket work comes in onto the square before the queen and with two drummers drumming starts out a loud high falsetto rising and falling to a rhythm that neither Stephen nor Jack can make out. Tapir whispers that the man is telling the story of the Queen's family way back to the beginning. Jack tries in vain to seize the man's pattern and finally closes his eyes to concentrate, but that eye closing turns out to be fatal. He wakes to find the entire table smiling at him. The man is gone. The fires are now red, no more than twilight. Two powerful men lift Jack. He makes his bow to the Queen and she returns it with the kindest look. They take him home, undress him, and he slips into the soft couch in the house that's been made for him on shore here. And Jack was rarely this tired. He recalls that this is a really unusual, deep, deep fatigue that he's experiencing here. He woke near the end of the middle watch, knowing that someone was in the room. A strong, centered arm pressed him down. His heart began to beat violently 
and he made room. So finally, we have the chance to supplant in Jack's mind the woman who had rebuffed him back in New South Wales. We've got Fifty Shades of Puolani right here. Right, right. Well, with first light coming through the door, Jack wakes again to Tom's agitated whisper. Sir, sir, excuse me, sir. The Franklin is in the offering. Sir, sir. Jack murmurs, pipe down, Tom. He gets <laughs> dressed and he looks at the beautiful sleeping queen there, you know, still on his sofa. You know, the carronades are already going down, getting, you know, taken up on the ship. Bondin relays Oak's report of having seen the Franklin in the West at dawn and that she'll soon show round the headland. Jack has them beat to arms. Wow. So uh, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. This was, this was all sounding kind of wrapping up and concluding and Jack sleeping with the queen and, you know, food and dancing and drinking. But wait, wait, hold on a minute. The Franklin is in the offing. Huh. Does it, is this really the last chapter? Let's take right. a look. As the jolly boat pulls out, the Franklin appears full and clear there for us to see. She seems suspicious. I'm not sure how we're supposed to infer this quality of being suspicious from seeing his ship far. Anyway, never mind. She seems suspicious but not alarmed, sailing in without shaking the nighttime reef out of her topsails. So maybe that's that's what it is. Coming up the side of the surprise, Jack has Adams write out an acting order for Oaks. He gets hold of the dispatches and the letters that they've drafted in support of Oaks and Clarissa. The surprises are as busy as bees on shore. Jack throws off his clothes. Well, he's only had them on for five minutes. Throws off his clothes and goes for a swim. And after breakfast, the Franklin is still unsure. Again, I don't know how we personify the boat to this extent that, you know, she's got an uncertain expression on her face somehow. I don't know. The Franklin throws out a signal and Jack replies with the old trick of a vague hoist that appears to jam and then gets withdrawn, wasting irreplaceable minutes as the Franklin continues cautiously standing in here. The carronades and the munitions are coming home with really incredible speed. The people are helping the true love to weigh, now with Oaks in command. Pulling's report, all hands aboard. The bosun's chair is rigged. Jack finally gives to Oaks the acting order and all the other papers and says... If Mrs. Oaks is ready, he should go aboard his command. Ah, here we go. Clarissa steps from the rail, thanks the captain for his great goodness to her, wishes them both a long and prosperous voyage, and asks that they give his dear love to England. And I'm sure his dear love to Sophie is implied, but perhaps not first on his mind, given where he spent the last night. Anyhow, Stephen kisses Clarissa on both cheeks, blesses her, hands her to the bosun's chair to be lowered to the true love. The True Loves, the, the, the now established crew of the True Loves under Oaks's command, give three cheers for the surprise, and the surprises return the cheers for the True Love and for Oaks and for their prize. Stephen and Clarissa wave at each other as the True Love pulls away. And Jack, this is a great moment. Well, Jack orders all hands to unmoor ship and tells Tom that they can demolish the crow's nest as they go. Stephen stands there, and the text says, and all at once he realized that the frigate, too, was underway, rapidly making sail and moving faster and faster eastwards after her flying quarry, so that the distance between the ships was increasing with dreadful speed. Before he was prepared for it, the true love was no more than a remote ship upon the sea, and there was no longer any human contact at all. End of chapter nine. End of Clarissa Oaks, the true love. Wow. Well, Mike, some things for us to talk about there, about what we've just witnessed, about what it all means, about how the story's been told and about what's coming next. But before we do that, before we do that, let's take a moment to share with the listeners the interview you and I had just a few days ago with our great and old friend of the podcast, um, novelist and O'Brien fan, Rachel McMillan. We're discussing the character of Clarissa Oaks, and we're super excited to have with us old friend of the podcast, Patrick O'Brien, super fan. And by the way, also not irrelevant here, Diana Villiers, super fan as well. Rachel McMillan is here with us. Welcome, Rachel. Hi, everybody. I love you guys so much. Oh, we love you too. Thank you. We love you. We love your books. <laughs> and, and we love seeing who the Sophie is in this book and who the Diana is in this yeah. book. Yeah, well done. 
So so here we are. We're, we're talking about Clarissa Oaks, and we've talked a lot about her as the chapters have come and gone, and there's something important that Mike and I lack in our perspective on Clarissa Oaks, which is that we're male. Yeah. And there is lots about Clarissa to talk about in terms of not just the character that she is, but how how she is as a female character, and we thought we can't let this go by without getting the female perspective. So for, for that and all the other reasons, Rachel, it's great to have you with us. The f- first time you read, I don't know if you can remember back to when you first read Clarissa Oaks or The True Love, how did the character first strike you? I loved it because O'Brien already has two really remarkably prevalent women within yeah. the canon. And it's like, oh, we're getting another one. Right. Um, and... I think it mostly struck me because it is, to put it brashly, it's a book about sex. It's a sex book in the middle of, I I don't biographically know where we're hitting on Patrick O'Brien's life and creativity at this point, but I thought that it was really interesting, especially in contrast to, you know, we've done the Jonah figure in naval mythology and he sometimes plays with the tropes of what happens when you have a woman on board. And obviously, yeah. um, anyone who's read to this point, we have seen Diana on board for yeah. one, I mean, several times. So we've gotten that experience. But I think that Clarissa served to function as everything is kind of in Jack's getting older and kind of grumpy. Everybody's been stuck on a ship for a long time. There's, you know, it can't be that much fun to always be writing about the dynamics between all of these men on yeah. in their explorations. And that's he shakes it up a bit with Stephen doing his espionage. But I think he brought in Clarissa Oaks just as a, what would happen if I set off a grenade in the middle of the surprise? And what happens is we see her kind of unintentionally hitting everybody. So I think that the first time I read it, and it has been several years um i was struck by the fact that its other title is the true love and that that was the ship name he chose because it's so ironic considering the lack of anything romantic with clarissa but i also just really liked wow this is what happens when you get a woman on board this is kind of typifying the uh, belief in nautical lore that women should not be allowed on ships even if they try to disguise themselves and wear male clothes like Clarissa does, yeah, and, and attract some so, so, some of some of a different kind of male gaze from Nathaniel Martin as well, kind of strange, yeah. strangely and tellingly. And it's interesting to me because I can't help but look at Clarissa as a counterbalance to Diana, right? Because hmm. she is the other kind of she uses her sexuality as a weapon. She is very aware of her femininity. She is a woman very much in a man's world. And we see her working in that man's world. And Clarissa comes on the scene. And there are several articles I found online, blogs and such, that posit that she is an asexual woman. And yet, given the lack of agency she has, given being a woman in her time period even though she does dress as a man, even though some scholars nowadays would look at her as like a g- the gender fluid character yeah. with yeah. conversations that Patrick O'Brien probably wasn't privy to in his time period, we still have a woman who has no agency. Yeah. And we have a woman who is very much tied to New... Th- I, guys, the fact that this is New South Wales, the convict, I, like yeah. he was, <laughs> he was really fascinating and why he chose all of the different moving parts in this book considering he was presenting another major female character yeah she's she's not ashore she's not you know on the english in the english channel she's not in boston she's on the far side of the world like that the, just out in the middle of nowhere and just also interesting to bring her up at a time where the domesticity and the domestic lives of both Stephen and jack are changing um and we see this in the letters, of course. Diana has had a baby. Um, Jack, for all that he wanted the domestic life with Sophie, is actually pretty terrible at it. So getting a woman who represents 
nothing maternal and nothing domestic out in this man's world. Just there's so many layers here. It's so cool. I love it. (laughs) Well, two things that struck me. Uh, One, you know, talking about Diana versus Clarissa or in in comparison to, you know, and both of them hate kids. And you Mm -hmm. have Stephen who, you know, would not be the first top of my mind to say, oh, this guy would love kids. He's like all excited about this. He's way excited about this. Now he has these two women again. And we had Stephen's kind of uh, observation back several books ago saying, gosh, look, we have a woman aboard. It makes everybody civilized. It's an inaccessible <laughs> yeah. woman, you know, and now we're testing that hypothesis in like, real time. Oh, it's all gone to hell. And I, oh, I yeah. love that. And I love that Clarissa finds a way to influence Stephen's espionage yeah. in that yeah. she is able yeah. to give intelligence that he is able to give to Joseph Blaine. And it shows that she really is a bit of a knife with like cutting through this world she absolutely upsets everything below deck she absolutely has sexually frustrated jack doing what jack does best which is just being grumpy and like oh yeah and just she brings if diana and sophie together end up bringing out parts of steven and jack that i think are for their betterment yeah clarissa comes in and brings out a bad side of many different people, yeah. but I don't necessarily think it's all her fault. Well, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think that's a fabulous point. I kind of wonder if any of it is her fault, yeah. other than you know, she does have this incredible desire to be liked and and is naive in some ways about yeah. what it takes to do that. But she's been brought up by men to you know kind of become this grenade. It seems like, and she doesn't particularly enjoy it i do enjoy the perspective that she is an asexual character who has no other currency for survival yes because we've talked in previous podcasts about how diana is if you ever feel that you're thinking oh diana what what a shrew um remember (laughs) how little agency she has which is why when she gives up her one that blue peter i love that she is her her independent she has to give up clarissa has nothing and she's clearly very smart and she gets married off not in a romantic way not in i'm on a boat called the true love which would make a great hallmark film Um, (laughs) i'm on a boat called the true love and i happen to find my true love it's more i'm on a boat called the true love and i have no options here it's it's really interesting and then true love is sailing away into the horizon never to be seen it's (laughs) never yeah and just the way he places it and the time in which he places it within the sequence of books i just think that maybe he thought you know if you're writing a series that long with characters that he introduces some characters later on in the book sam panda of course you know some some major players i wonder if i've never written 21 books about the same people but (laughs) You you, you might get a little tired of That's a really good point. the same thing again. So I like to picture Patrick O'Brien out there in France in his little potting shed or wherever he was writing. And he's like, I think it's time for another woman. And the fact that, you know, there's just so much about Clarissa that aligns with, I, I love the fact that women were not supposed to be on ships, but ships are feminized they are named yes. for ladies yeah. um the book is named clarissa oaks it's not named for some odd little island or <laughs> some, you know a boat that they're pursuing she really is the catalyst in which everything in this particular plot turns on so yeah. i i hope that the listeners who are just reading through the series for the first time are like Oh, that's how Patrick O'Brien shakes things up. <laughs> yeah, and 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 to nobody's credit, really. I mean, she, we'll we'll wait and see what kind of agency and what kind of future she yeah. gets. I, I want to come back to that in a minute, but it's to, to nobody's credit. And I, I like the the way you said it's not her fault. And actually, she's kind of a lightning rod for all of the fault, all the potential fault of all of the male characters around her. I mean, just about everybody has this kind of illicit desire for her, and quite a few of them put it into action to to 
to their, you know, to their shame and their disadvantage and, you know. And it's ugh. interesting what it says towards human nature, though, because, you know, you do have long stints in Patrick O'Brien where there are no women. It's very yeah. much a male world. Those instincts and desires, if you put a woman on a ship, it's like, you know, it's base human nature. It, it makes sense that some of the not so <laughs> wonderful aspects of some of the crew members would uh, would come out in this way with this particular person. So yeah. it's uh, it's an interesting one. I'm just trying to think. Um, but it, it maybe it's yeah. a little bit of a minor. Well, it, what, what might have been a minor turns into a major comeuppance for Stephen. You know, he he ought to have known from his experiment with bees back in Post Captain, right? He ought to have yeah. known that just yeah, you know, theorizing about introducing some new species that would be interesting to observe. He ought to have known that seeing this introduction of this new species was going to be... And <laughs> what I enjoy about Stephen is for all that I love the, for better or worse, love story between Stephen yeah. and Diana, neither Jack and Stephen, and I think that because they're products of their time period and environment, know anything about women. They yeah. don't even, they don't even try. And I think that... To Patrick O'Brien's credit, he really strikes this, you know, double standard of I'm going to establish really strong female characters who actually shake things up. They're not passive. Yeah. Even Sophie, who is the more traditional at home raising the kid type of woman, she she has a lot to say. She's the one who brings out one of the major surprises in this book uh, that perhaps Stephen and Diana's daughter is not a typical child like yeah. that. Oh, it's very, yeah. very interesting how much weight the women pull in terms of how the plot progresses here. Yeah, absolutely. And St Stephen and Jack are both trying to sort of account for each other to, to, to their spouses in these letters and are doing a pretty bad job. <laughs> and I love that it uses letters because it shows how powerful O'Brien's series is powerful in ensuring that the women, the major women in the story, namely Diana and Sophie are always, always present, even if they're not in this specific action. Yeah. They are the reason that Jack and Steven make dumb decisions, the reason they make good decisions. Here they're in letters in ways that Steven and Jack are trying to figure. It's almost like they're writing their spouses to figure out their own internal stuff. It's yeah. <laughs> whether Diana or Sophie are actually on the page, they're still really always important to the story. And I love the way that Patrick O'Brien uses that yeah it almost comes to mind for me sometimes it's like evolution meets society here here are these mm -hmm. you know these males kind of evolved to deposit sperm on demand here's a society set up around not doing that all the time and you know a, a patriarchy who then gives roles for people and then all these mythos and how we think about things even the simple thing of Stephen in here talking about, well, you know, in Japan, kissing is the same as coitus is for us. Yeah. And it's, you know, how we think about these things. And I, I, I guess one of the things for me too, and, and we, we put a trigger warning on, on the episode because it was like, you know, Clarissa has had this incredibly, incre I mean, you know, yeah, we go through these battle scenes and these guys have... But, I mean, she's lived this all her life, and she's come out really tough in a lot yeah. of ways and still very social and still very wanting to be in relationship. And I, I, I don't know. I just I don't know where to go with all that, but it's I just a mixture. I love it because if we look at the men and what they want from Clarissa, you know, she compares life in a brothel to life at sea. So that we get her perspective on this. Yes. We get the men being like, oh, she wants us to, you know, they probably think that wooing Clarissa is like, well, I'm pretty great. Clarissa <laughs> is not that interested. And yeah, this I think is like that blowing that, my nose. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she it's it's a sad state of affairs that 
her wanting to find self-validation means that she has to engage in the way that the men want her to engage. Yeah. And that is a major statement about how little women were able to exercise social conduct without having, in Clarissa's case, to use their sexuality. And I think it's really interesting that Clarissa does not come away from any of those interactions with any sense of, oh, I'm in love or, oh, I've no. been changed. It's like, whatever. Whereas the she absolutely <laughs> ruined <laughs> the, <laughs> the politics of a ship for a while. Yeah. And I think that that says a lot about some of the uh, generalizations. I never want to speak in specifics when right. we're talking about genders, but yeah, the, right. the generalizations about men and women, especially in this time period, especially in what women were seen as good for, and the very little opportunities and options they had. Um, right. We've seen it with Diana, and now we see it with Clarissa. And Diana nice. is neat because she is so feminine in the way she presents herself in the way that she is you know the way she dresses the way she engages the way she seduces men clarissa when she shows up is not dressed like a no. woman she has none of those qualities and yet it you know we're seeing two very different women who are stuck in similar situations oh. and thrown into this world the one thing that diana has Again, for better or for worse, because it's not the smoothest sailing of relationships, <laughs> is no. that Stephen d just does really care about, she at least has Stephen. Even yeah. if their love story is a treacherous one, at the end, there's always a friendship and a bond there. And that's yeah. something that Clarissa has none of. Yeah. So that leads me to ask, what, uh, as you, I mean, maybe I'm asking you to imagine something that's impossible, Rachel, which is, you know, you get to, <laughs> end, get to the end of Clarissa Oaks and you don't know what's coming next in the arc of the canon. But especially from a, from a, from a woman's perspective, as you look ahead, are you thinking, now, I, I wonder if this woman can get to the place that she needs to get to in order to be safe in the world? Or are you thinking, oh my gosh, what new havoc is she going to create in, in the next new environment that she finds herself in? Right. I always think just because you marry her off doesn't mean marriage does not end any story or make anything easier. No. We have both Jack and Sophie and definitely it's, Diana and Stephen exhibits a, B, to and C, prove D. that. <laughs> what I did find interesting is I, I always like looking at how Patrick O'Brien ends the stories. He never just ends. It's never the end. Like, yeah. It's, you know, we I when we talked about Patrick O'Brien and music, the fact that he ended on that one Mozart opera, the fact that he ends when Jack is in the stocks, that major scene when everybody rallies around him, reverse of yes. the middle. Yeah. Um, yes. And he ends Clarissa's story with a description of the boat in a very feminine way. Her deck sloped, she leaned her larboard bow well down, overtaking the swell and splitting it with a fine broad slash of white all the tones of the rigging quite different from the various sets of stays, shrouds, and backstays, and of course, all the cordage, rows and rows, and by the first dog watch, the resultant voice of all these sounds, blah, blah, blah. He is describing a ship with very feminine tones, including yeah. stays, which we know were very yeah. prominent in a woman's right. dress. And I don't think this is just Patrick O'Brien sitting there thinking, okay, I got to get out of this story. So like, let's describe some sea stuff. I think he's very much reminding us that even though we are working with a very masculine centric world of nautical adventure yeah he takes the time to describe the ship in a feminine way i just i love that it's so good well and, and it goes <laughs> back to earlier in the same book when pullings was telling jack what was actually going on with the officers and jack says well you know the husband is always the last to know. I'm, of course, speaking about me yeah. as the captain being married to the surprise. Yeah. yeah. And it's... I just, I thought it was very lovely that he describes it, and it goes on and on, just in this really evocative. Um, yeah. He uses beautifully modeled, wind-blowing white, pure blue, all of these things that we, all of these terms we would ascribe to a romantic moment. Yeah. And it's to end Clarissa's story where she's married off and 
who the hell knows what will happen to her and who the hell knows what will happen to Diana and Sophie in future books. Patrick O'Brien never just sets something up without setting off what's going to happen. He's casting the line for other relationship things that we will not talk about because of the spoilers. Mm -hmm. But I think readers should just keep in mind that he's very fastidious in his plotting and the way that things are fast paced and the way that they are placed, not only for this specific book, but for the rest of the books to come. He, he knows where he's going. And, and I think luckily at this point, he still has Mary there to help. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> and by the way, there's, there's nothing, at least from a quick look at the Dean King book, there's, there's nothing biographically to say that there's some reason why he, mm. like, I don't think he thought let's write a, book, write a book about sex. I think he did very likely think, well, gee, these people have been traveling around the world for a while now. And let's, like you say, Rachel, let's throw a What other carried, Ed, I think it's to shake up what haven't I covered in terms of ah. dynamics on a ship. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. we've had so many other things go on within the canon in terms of, I, I think he's like, what, what haven't we really explored? And Diane has been on and off boats, but... Diana has been off bounds for a lot of the regular surprisers, surprises, surprisers, shipment. Um, (laughs) Diana has had her moments of making things miserable for men and absolutely shaking up relationships. I mean, Jack and Steven almost got into a duel over Mm -hmm. her. So there is a huge, (laughs) there's a huge Diana thing, but I think that, this was an opportunity for him to bring in another woman who was going to affect not just the main characters, but some of the people on the sidelines. Um, No one is safe (laughs) from from a woman on a ship. (laughs) Well, you know what this is crying out for? I mean, just supposing that we don't know what's coming next in the canon, this Mm -hmm. is crying out for a whole other book where set in the convent where um, Gediminy Yagiello shows up. And we yes. see what happens so when no. it there. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody who writes fan fiction. Yeah. I've never actually read Patrick O'Brien fan fiction that I people read. It. I bet there's a ton out there. I um, there is. And this, I and I do encourage anyone who's listening to just type Clarissa Oaks in and see the different perspectives. Um, um. There is a blogger who writes about asexual characters in literature and Clarissa Oaks comes up as one of them. And I thought that was really interesting because how often do you think about Patrick O'Brien presenting a character who reflects what this person's experience has been and the blogger really identified with Clarissa Oaks. And it's also a wonderful irony to have uh, if you pursue that perspective, an asexual character in a book that really is preoccupied with sex. It's like, it's, yeah. it's a sex book, not a dirty one, no. but, <laughs> but sex in terms of, of course, the physical arena, but also in terms of gender. Um, yep. And that's, that's yep. why Patrick O'Brien is so fascinating. And I hope at one point we get, do get to do a talk about, the Mary books and then the post Mary books and how yeah. Patrick Ooh, O'Brien's please. personal life influenced how he wrote yeah. women in oh, yes, the canon. Nice. Wouldn't nice, that nice. be good? Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we had a chat a little while ago with, with, with our guest, Josh Corey, and he mentioned the, the likelihood or the kind of suggestion that Clarissa is on the autistic spectrum. I and, thought that's interesting. Yeah. I wonder, especially because of the little we are learning about Stephen and Diana's daughter, yeah, that yeah. you know she is very well placed in. I, I think I, I personally, and I can't speak as any kind of expert, but I personally welcome that uh, perspective on yeah. the character. I think that it's we can't read into. O'Brien's intentions, but I can very much see how it would work with his establishing the theories about uh, Stephen and Diana's little girl. So that's very interesting. But I was just thinking about that in connection with the idea of Clarissa as an example of an asexual character. There's Mm -hmm. probably a parallel line of thinking about, you know, let's look at where um, people on the autistic spectrum have appeared in literature later on. 
it's a very 20th century perspective, like often yeah. he does, you know, a, a late 20th century view of well, people and their psychology. It landed in the in the world of the early 19th century. I think it's one of the things that makes the book so brilliant. I mean, we've been told from the get-go that this is, you know, you know, this is Stephen saying it's a psych lab. It looks like a ship, but it's a psych lab. And we're going to yeah. see what, you know, all about people and, and the human condition. And that's what and we're doing here. I, I just, oh, and I love whenever we get Stephen's pragmatic letters and journals and just yes. how, just, oh, I, this is why he's the best because there you could talk about each one of these books forever. Even if people don't have personal favorites, if you're reading through and you're like, oh, that one's a bit of a dud, it yeah. still holds up. Oh, yeah. I right. Like I'm such a Patrick O'Brien fangirl, and I think, and I say this every time we chat. One of the greatest disappointments is that more women i don't think know exactly how female centric these books are and i do know that they have rejigged some of the cover copy with the harper collins the most recent editions to actually mention diana and sophie and i think that that is gonna do a great job but he he just writes women so well and more importantly he writes women at all and not just as Oh, look, Horatio Hornblower has a woman that he can save for four seconds. Sorry, Hornblower. Yeah. But in the tradition of these, oh, or Sharp, yeah. Sharp is going to have a, a girlfriend so that we can see he is brave and then she'll disappear. They, they become Bond women, Bond girls like James yeah, right. Bond, like they're disposable. Right. They're to serve the male action. And Patrick O'Brien doesn't do that. Clarissa Oakes is not serving jack and steven's stories she's serving her own even if it ends tragically even if her life is tough she's not there to do anything of consequence that would serve the other men on the ship and i i love that and o'brien does that again and again and i think we have mary to thank for some of that yeah i think you're very i think you're very right and if you're a male reader we're being educated i mean mike and i (laughs) yes yes There's, there's, there's oh, a perspective there for us awesome. to pick up on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Can you think of any other characters like this that kind of, in, in literature, that land and have this oh. great sort of explosive impact oh. on all the people around them? I think Dickens does this well. Mm-hmm. Nice. Um, women are often a catalyst for many. You think of Esther Summerson in Bleak House, yeah. who is on the outside a very... Um, meek and wonderful and pure-hearted person but just her very existence absolutely shatters everything i think thomas hardy does this well <gasps> yeah um good. Yeah. with uh far from the madding crowd yeah, yeah, see, Aberdeen. yeah yeah uh i i'm a victorianist <laughs> like my <laughs> studies are victor so i think that they do a really good job of showing how women can absolutely shake an entire society hardy dickens uh vanity fair you know becky yeah. sharp mm. is another woman mm. who is just absolutely belongs in that book that doesn't have a hero he says you know that the subtitle of that is a book without a hero it doesn't say it's not a book without a heroine right oh. i think that that's really interesting so i think in literature and shakespeare plays up with this uh a lot where mm-hmm. women do become sometimes intention unintentionally and sometimes most importantly because they have no other agency or option right right and we tend to look at oh my gosh these women who are just ruining the lives of men well no the women have so few opportunities oh irene adler in oh, yeah, um, scandal sure. in bohemia yeah. to, she was always the woman she she absolutely was a far more interesting adversary to him than most of the other criminals there yeah, yeah definitely and she fought for what she wanted yeah. and she outsmarted him and she almost upturned an entire empire and kingdom so i think that that's cool but what i find more cool is when the woman is not traditionally the face that wants a thousand ships clarissa Mm -hmm. oaks is not a great beauty diana is not 
painted as a great beauty. She's painted as striking and mm -hmm. it's her character and her femme fatale that yeah. allows her to be so beguiling. And I, I just love that. I think the other point that I was thinking about a minute ago was how it grieves me that, you know, there's an old phrase, stepping over gold to pick up pennies. And I, I feel like, you know, these men, like they're sitting there in the gun room. She's so fascinated by the ship. She's so fascinated yeah. by the history. They love that. Stephen makes a point to say how she always listens. She doesn't interrupt. You know, she is just great company. She is a great friend. And then we step over that because of this other stuff. Yeah. And we miss that. And we miss this opportunity to have a great friendship, to have a great interaction, to have all this. It's a shame. But it's also very interesting that savvy women know in order to survive that there's nothing men like better than explaining <laughs> things to them. <laughs> right. It's true. It's absolutely true. Well, no, no, no. Let, let, let me tell you where you're getting that wrong. Let me, let me, let me. Just... Right. I mean, then, Listen, then, sweetheart, then, let me put this right for you. <laughs> and that's why I love you guys. This is a mansplater free zone. Right. No, you, but you a should... woman has to spend like two seconds on Twitter to be. Oh, well, actually. Oh my gosh. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Lord. Oh, what a great book. No, They're all good. Oh, it's all great. <laughs> So listen, Rachel, thank you so much for oh, spending time welcome. with us. T tell us a little bit for a second. How, first of all, how, how's Mozart Code going? And Good. what else What else are you working on right now? Um, I'm like... finishing a book called Operation Scarlet, and Ooh. it comes out next fall. And it is a retelling of the Scarlet Pimpernel story in 1940s occupied France. Um, wow. I was surprised no one had done the Pimpernel trope in that time period other than a movie with uh, Leslie Howard called Pimpernel Smith. So I... I'm playing with that. It's It's been a lot of fun because I love the Scarlet Pimpernel. Another great female character is in the Scarlet. She's called the most intelligent woman in Europe. I love I love that. Nice. nice. And yeah. just in case people don't already know, tell us where they can find you on social media. How do they find you? Oh, that? all of my handles are at Rach K Mick, R-A-C-H-K-M-C, Instagram, Twitter, um, and Facebook. I'm on Facebook. You can follow me on Goodreads, but I, I always jump at the chance to ch chat about Patrick O'Brien because again, Patrick O'Brien is just waiting for more women readers to like <laughs> scoop him up <laughs> and then we can all talk about him forever. <laughs> that would be great. Brilliant. Rachel, thanks so much. I, I, I've told Ian the other day that, uh, you know, this actually goes back several months ago, but I was sitting there having some major dental work done and, and my dentist was saying, what, you know, you are so interested in that book. What, you know, what is that book? And then the assistants everywhere can say, what is that? You know, it's like, you know, you're just not paying any attention to anything we're doing. You're just waiting for those breaks to get back to your book. And so I was reading Mozart card. And, oh, that's so and, cool. And so they were, thank they were you. All, all right, I'm going to get that right now. So thank you. Love it. Oh, that's so nice. Well, thanks guys. I love talking to you. Yeah. Thanks once again. Great to have you with us and uh, good luck with everything else that's going on. Thank you. Great. Take care. But it's always wonderful to talk to Rachel. She was off to Ireland, I believe, is in Ireland, even as we're speaking these words, well, recording them back. Yeah. And um, just love her insights, love her insights, and love all the echoes back in her writing to O'Brien's writing back yeah. and forth here. Um, thanks so much, Rachel. Well, here we are, the end of another volume, Ian. Yeah, and, uh, I, and quite the action-packed, chapter here that just that that last line mike or, or almost feels like it belongs in another novel um, right. no more than a remote ship upon the sea no longer any human contact at all what do you it, make it, of it it's haunting it's haunting for me i i was so struck by it it, it made me think that you know perhaps stephen had become the real human contact for clarissa and that maybe Clarissa, again, kind of the real human contact for Stephen, that, you know, mm. in, in kind of working with Clarissa, Stephen himself was becoming even more and more human, you know, seeing into her as a human being so much, yeah. loving her, appreciating her, you know, validating her, helping her, you know, and, and the thing that all of us want and need so much, you know, being met where we are rather than yeah. having people sitting in judgment, not listening to us. You know, there she was with this, friend where she was safe where she could learn more about the world and about herself through this newfound friendship and 
I have to say that it, you know, this line has stuck with me uh, it's over and over because it was like, no, I wanted this to be brighter, but no human contact at all. I don't know, man. It's, it's powerful. It, it really is. It reminds me a little bit of science fiction as well. It could almost, if there was a Star Trek novel, that could almost have been the, the, the closing line of a Star Trek novel or screenplay. No more human contact. You know, the ship sailing off a, a dot into infinity. Wow. Which, is, which was, again, kind of where we started out. We're on the far side of the world. We're far, far east of New South Wales. We're in their wastes of the Pacific. It go, goes back to that remoteness of life on board ship. Um, it was nice as well, I think, to see the the real reaction that Jack had to slaughter the, the, to the to the final battle. There, it had seemed like he didn't really care, but it seemed like he'd completely hardened his heart to right. what was going to happen. The 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 slaughter still took place, but people were allowed to escape. It was nice to get that image that we had of Jack as a humane leader restored a little bit, and um, it, it it's interesting to think back to his reaction when the former South Seas pirates, I think way back in HMS Surprise, had slit the throats of, of enemies. This is clearly a kind of savagery and a kind of aspect of warfare that O'Brien senses and feels and wants to bring us back to, not, not with a sense of sort of approbation, but just to say this is a feature of the way things go when people are at war. Right. And plus, he, he gets rewarded with feeling a little bit better of, about himself with... <gasps> Oh, Jack, a night in the bed of the Queen. What about Sophie, hey? Yeah, yeah, right, right. Well, and, and you know, we leave it with the Franklin in the offing and they're out chasing her. It almost sounds a little bit like the end of the movie Mastering. Yes, you know, yes, exactly. No, you know, no, yeah. no plot which that was drawn from, but this one, you know, kind of looks a little bit like that. And we've got that radical detour that Stephen knew. Have we seen the last of him and his machinations? Are we going to be on the way to South America, the original mission? Are we ever going to make it back to England again? You know, we've got five complete books left in the canon and yeah. nothing but a wine dark sea ahead of us. Mike, there's, there's only one thing for it. What do you say to reaching down another volume and treating ourselves next week to a whole new chapter of Patrick O'Brien? Oh, I should like that of all things. to the end for the outtake. Life is full of disappointments.